Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Peter Berry. And what we'll do is we're, we'll hear from each of the panelists. Uh, they'll each give a presentation, and then we'll go to a question and answer session after that. Oh, great. Uh, thank Peter. you very much, Kara. Uh, uh, and thanks uh, kindly to uh, Helen and Monica and uh, the two institutes for the um, opportunity to be here today. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's great um, uh, that the panel is focusing on, on climate change. Uh, it's a big concern to uh, health authorities in Canada, to Canadians. Uh, so really excited to be here to talk a little bit about what Health Canada is uh, doing um, and also to learn from the other presentations and from the discussion uh, afterwards. So um, I've got too many slides. I'm going to go th quickly through my slides in terms of uh, uh, updated information on climate change risk to health, uh, how we understand uh, risks and vulnerabilities and to support adaptation, uh, but really invite anybody if uh, you'd like further information after the um, uh, presentation to contact me. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and please do so. So um, we're all very aware of this. Uh, the globe is heating quickly. Um, this is a, a bit uh, dated, uh, it's uh, from, from NOAA, but we know that uh, nine of the ten uh, warmest um, uh, years have occurred since uh, 2005. And so this is actually, 2018 marks the 42nd uh, consecutive year that we've been above uh, average temperatures. Uh, so from a health perspective, that's really important, and it's important that we're warming uh, more and more quickly. And so in Canada, uh, Canada, a northern country, is actually warming uh, more quickly than other countries, uh, about twice as uh, quickly. Um, and of concern, too, is uh, northern communities uh, are, are warming very, very rapidly, and that's why we're seeing a number of uh, impacts uh, in the north that I'm sure you're uh, all aware of in terms of permafrost melt and, and various things. And this warming is going to continue uh, into the future. Um, this is actually looking at um, uh, a, a sort of a worst case scenario um, in the in winter. Uh, and we know that some areas uh, are projected to warm by as much as five or six um, uh, degrees average temperatures. Those aren't extreme temperatures. Those are average temperatures by 2051 to 2080. Um, and, and there's quite a bit of certainty around uh, the fact that uh, uh, temperatures are going to increase. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, in uh, a month or two, they're going to have the latest assessment on Canada's changing climate and that's going to provide um, updated information uh, in this regard. So the important thing here is over the next few decades, uh, irrespective of what we do with reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we are going to keep warming. Health risks are going to increase. So we have this uh, health uh, imperative, or this health adaptation imperative. We need to uh, uh, increase our adaptation efforts. And so Canadians are concerned about uh, climate change impacts on health. This is from a recent uh, survey uh, done by Environics in 2017. Uh, a majority of Canadians are concerned, but we also see that uh, the, the knowledge of some of the particular impacts on health is, uh, is low. So there's a bit of a knowledge gap in terms of the range of ways uh, that climate change can impact health. So uh, it's something that um, uh, needs to be addressed. Now, in terms of some of the examples of specific health risks, uh, a colleague in the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, about 10 years ago, um, he actually projected that with climate warming, uh, we would expect to see certain vectors uh, that can cause disease in humans uh, increase. And this was actually validated in our most uh, recent uh, assessment in 2014. Um, and we are, sure enough, seeing, as uh, many of you are aware, Lyme disease uh, expanding into Canada, and it's uh, increasing quite, uh, quite rapidly. But we also uh, are concerned about uh, climate change impacts on air pollution and then on health. And there's a number of ways that this can uh, uh, happen through increases in, for example, ground level ozone, uh, particulate matter, think of recent uh, wildfires uh, or even droughts, um, aeroallergens in some regions of Canada, we've seen the ragweed season uh, increase by up to a month and a lot of people have um, allergies, so that's, that's of concern. There's a number of ways that uh, climate change can impact uh, air quality. And you'll see that our office does a lot of work on extreme heat and health. And uh, health or heat events can have uh, very significant impacts on health. You can see hundreds of people uh, dying during these uh, singular events. Uh, and in, it, what's really important is in communities that are not prepared, you can really have very serious impacts. So you'll recall in Russia or in Europe, there were tens of thousands of uh, deaths in, in some of the heat events. And more recently, even in India and uh, Pakistan. So communities really have to be prepared for this. And uh, uh, that's something that uh, Health Canada is uh, working with partners on. 
So we are observing a, a number of different uh, impacts, um, also on, uh, on health systems and on things like uh, mental health. Um, so the Fort McMurray fires, which I'm sure you're all aware of, I'm, I'm standing right in front of this, but uh, there were um, documented increases in uh, things like uh, PTSD, uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and even uh, the, the Calgary floods in 2013, health facilities themselves, uh, which are so important for protecting people, uh, were actually impacted. So there's, there's a number of things that we are documenting. So how do we understand risks and vulnerabilities uh, to support uh, adaptation moving forward? Well, the good news is we've got a lot of guidance about how communities, uh, public health authorities, provinces, the uh, national government can actually uh, increase understanding, scientific evidence about these risks to take action. Um, health Canada, our office, actually helped develop this uh, guidance document with the World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization in 2013. And it highlights the different steps that uh, need to be taken to frame uh, uh, a study and then to move forward with uh, undertaking it. And so this is a, a bit of an example of what's going to be uh, providing the next national climate change and health assessment that we're, sorry, we're leading with a number of uh, partners. Uh, a colleague out of the University of Toronto, uh, Katie Hayes, is uh, really becoming an expert on uh, mental health impacts of climate change. And she's been looking at um, you know, populations of concern uh, from things like uh, wildfires and, and floods. Uh, for example, um, you know, older adults, uh, people um, that are underhoused, uh, uh, poor people, um, but also at the, the potential uh, mental health outcomes. So again, uh, PTSD, depression, but also things like aggression and substance abuse. And so that's uh, something that uh, our office is gonna look uh, more at because there's a lot of um, uh, knowledge gaps uh, in that regard. And this just uh, provides a, a bit of a, an indication of how complex some of those uh, vulnerability factors can be when you're trying to plan adaptations. This is from a guidance document Health Canada developed on heat and health and how you assess uh, impacts and vulnerabilities. And you'll see that you know, at the individual level, there's a number of uh, factors that can imp in, uh, impact uh, health outcomes, such as if uh, people are taking certain medications that predispose them to heat illness. Uh, again, uh, age, uh, income, uh, even personal behaviors, whether or not people uh, listen to heat alerts, for example. And then at the, um, uh, at the community level, things like urban design, do you live where there's an urban heat island that heats up your community? Or do you have cooling options that, uh, that you can go to? So you need to understand all of these uh, factors uh, in order to take actions that are really effective in protecting health. So just some of the science uh, needs and challenges uh, moving forward that uh, we're working with uh, partners on, and I'll talk a little bit about these in the last few minutes of my presentation, are you know, projecting uh, future health impacts of climate change. There's uh, some uncertainty when you project out in terms of what we might expect for things like mental health. Uh, but also monitoring and surveillance of, uh, of health impacts and uh, making sure that you've got um, all the data that you need to see whether or not uh, weather and other hazards are affecting health. Um, we do need more climate change and health assessments and uh, our office is going to be supporting uh, some of that. And also I'm standing right in front of um, the fact that we need to work with other sectors to build healthy, uh, resilient uh, communities uh, moving forward. So in terms of some of the current activities that uh, Health Canada is taking with, uh, with again, a range of partners, um, I guess one of the, the first things to, to mention is um, that there's a huge opportunity here actually to improve health uh, if we do a good job of um, uh, designing our greenhouse gas mitigation measures, but also our adaptation measures, uh, because there's lots of co-benefits that, uh, that one can, can get from some of these, uh, these um, policies. For example, reduced uh, respiratory diseases if you have active travel, bike lanes and things like that. So there's a, a big um, uh, health opportunity. Uh, the WHO calls this the greatest health opportunity actually that, uh, that we have. And, and we have to remember that we've been very, very successful, the health community, the, the broad health community in improving health globally in the last number of decades. So you actually see the life expectancy for a number of countries is really risen dramatically uh, by 15 or even 17 years uh, for a number of countries since 1980. There's still lots to be done, but we do have the capability to, to do this. And the other thing is um, there are examples of adaptation measures that have been very, very effective in, in uh, protecting health. 
So in Bangladesh, improved disaster education, early warning systems, and a network of cyclone shelters has dramatically reduced uh, the number of people that uh, are killed during uh, cyclones. It's still quite large and, and too large, but uh, some of the uh, other cyclones uh, decades ago really had uh, much greater impact. So we need to really learn from these, uh, 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 these adaptations and from these examples moving forward. So at the federal level, uh, the four uh, organizations or health partners that are really uh, taking uh, action in terms of helping Canadians prepare for some of these health impacts uh, include um, uh, our office at uh, Health Canada, and we're uh, looking at um, expanding heat alert response systems uh, to communities uh, at risk um, and undertaking other measures in that re uh, regard. Also developing um, a, a national uh, uh, climate change monitoring and surveillance uh, strategy to get better data um, to inform things like these assessments. Um, and uh, we're also in a, in a few weeks going to be um, launching a, a program to actually provide support to public health uh, officials to undertake some of these assessments. So we're really excited about that. But we have colleagues in Indigenous Services Canada that provide funding and support to northern and southern communities uh, to undertake uh, research uh, using traditional knowledge and with Indigenous researchers. I think they've uh, funded uh, uh, 200 projects, so it's uh, quite a, a successful uh, uh, project. Um, the Public Health Agency of Canada focuses on infectious diseases and, and uh, the climate change impacts in that regard. And the Canadian Institute for Health uh, Research uh, is really focusing on food security in the north and Lyme disease. So there's a lot of activity um, uh, being undertaken at the federal level in this regard. And so I think I mentioned our uh, next uh, National Climate Change and Health Assessment. It's going to be released in 2021. Uh, there's a lot of information um, uh, available um, at the, the website. And in fact, uh, people can input um, in terms of becoming reviewers of the various chapters and just uh, uh, providing even documents that uh, might be so. So it's a very um, engaged uh, uh, process that uh, we're following. And uh, there are other reports being led by Natural Resources Canada that might be of interest as well. And a lot of what we're doing, and I mentioned this, uh, will be used by other health authorities at the provincial, uh, territorial, and local level because they need baseline information to undertake their assessments. And uh, the great news is there's a lot of uh, these assessments uh, that have been uh, taken. And, and uh, as I said, we're going to be providing support for, for more of these. So uh, this is, again, really the evidence base needed to uh, protect Canadians. So uh, this is my last slide I just want to mention because we're at the University of Ottawa. We've benefited tremendously um, by the input of students uh, over the years. Uh, all of these reports, including the 2008 Comprehensive Assessment Report and the Middlesex London Climate Change and Health Vulnerability Assessment, uh, have uh, benefited from student contributions. Um, and these are some current projects. Uh, we've got three um, uh, co-authors uh, in, the, in the national assessment uh, that are either students or recent students. So this is a great way that uh, we're trying to build capacity and we're benefiting uh, uh, significantly from that. So I'll leave it there and hopefully I didn't go over time. Thank you, Peter, very much for that uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation about the science in addressing uh, strategies, climate change strategies. Um, it's good to know what's going on at the federal level, too. Um, so we've got a lot of ground to, to cover, uh, but I think that sort of segues nicely into... Uh